Good morning, y'all. What a beautiful day. It's nice that we have a little bit of a cooler weather. And with the cooler weather, we're going to have some a good time next week going out and evangelizing before our two weeks of winter shows up. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. There's, there's three weeks. Um, yeah, Houston does not get cold much. All right, time for tithes and offerings. Thank you, everyone, who's been just sowing into everything God's been doing here. It's been amazing. Um, because of your, your finances sowing in, the kingdom is preached. The gospel is preached. Souls are being saved. People are being set free. Healing is being received. Um, it, it actually frees Olivia and my schedule up to have, we have anywhere from one to five ministry sessions with people privately um, per week. So, um, so we stay busy. So thank you for your support. Thank you for just sowing into what God's doing. All right, next week, this is a very important message. Next week, we're not meeting here. We're having an evangelism event next week in place of church. We're taking church to the streets. So we're not meeting here next week. I'm saying that again. People who are watching, if you come here, we ain't here. <laughs> uh, but the Holy Spirit's going to be with us in Marlin Plaza, okay? So next week, there, instead of meeting here, we're taking church to the streets. The <laughs> event is going to be co-led by Rhonda Raven and Connor Williford. Uh, two of our favorite people, two of our most trusted friends, um, they're, they're going to start off with two groups. But if that, if the, hopefully everyone shows up, but if it gets really large, just split them up into twos and fours and just send them out, um, two by two, four by four, uh, probably no more than four, because I remember being evangelized if a group of 30 people are walking towards me. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to remember being unsafe. So yeah. for ex-Buddhists, it was creepy to have a group of people saying, hey, do you do you, know, do you know where you're going when you die? And I'm like, are you, I grew up in the ghetto, so I was like, am I about to find out? So, um, so be careful with big, big groups. You know what I'm talking about. Kendrick knows what I'm talking about. Like when you're out there, someone goes, hey, do you know where you're going to go when you die? Are you, are you, are you, are you, is that a threat? You know, um, I grew up in martial arts, so I didn't, I didn't take well to threats much. Okay, again, I'm going to say it again. You're not meeting in this house. If you're watching online and you're planning on meeting for the first time, do not meet in this house. It's going to be in Maryland Plaza. There's a Ross that's there. We had an evangelism event a few months ago, I think in April. Y'all met in front of Ross. Y'all are just going to gather there, hang out a little bit, wait for the group to come. And then um, Rhonda and Connor are just going to lead y'all in, 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 in prayer and then split the teams up and go out and evangelize. Um, please meet there around 11 a.m. Is that, that's good for two y'all, 11 a.m.? Just meet there about 11 a.m. They'll probably wait till like 11, 15, 11, 30 before they, they, they start moving out um, and doing things. And, and it's a huge center. There's Target there, H-E-B there. People are probably watching right now going, what? Um, there's, we, Olivia and I, we evangelize five below, which is a, which supposedly everything's five dollars or less, but, uh, they're not. But we went into Five Below and, and actually spoke to two people who were, who were stealing phone cases, and we led them, and a le uh, God led us to lead them to, to salvation, receiving the Holy Spirit, repentance. Um, it was amazing. So it's going to be a great time. It's a huge center. Ross is out there. What else is out there? Uh, Target, Ross, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods is out there, Starbucks, you know, caf caf caffeine. Yeah, HB's out there. Caffeine will really give you a boost with the Holy Spirit. So, uh, uh, you know, just go out there and just be spirit-led. And all things, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when you're out there, be spirit-led, okay? And then afterwards, you're all going to gather in some place where, where uh, Rhonda and Connor choose. You're just going to gather, share testimonies, best practices, things you've learned, uh, things you experience. Um, there, there will be some rejection, and it's not, they're not rejecting you, right? When you're going out there, Rhonda and I, first time we evangelized together, the first, like, 10 people I encountered rejected Jonathan. I thought, and I was like, this is odd. I'm not used to people saying no to me. Um, but it was a learning experience for me because it's not about me, right? So go out there. Also, if you've never evangelized before, don't worry. You can just follow a group around and learn and just watch. Everyone evangelizes with their own personality, with their own way, by led by the Holy Spirit. So it looks different for everybody. So don't be nervous about evangelizing for the first time because, you know, we all have first time evangelism. I started evangelizing 
when I first got saved, started reading the Bible, and God said to preach the gospel, go heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and I went out and tried it because I, I read it from Jesus, and I was like, he wants me to do this. I don't know how to do this. I might as well hit the streets to look for these people to try this on because it's, 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 it's what Jesus commanded me to do, I thought, and it's true. So, All right, we do have a ministry session after church today. Those who have been ministered to by our group, by our church, actually our ch those who are watching online, our church ministers to each other, which is probably the most exciting thing for Olivia and I to see. Y'all are maturing and, and just loving on each other, and, and there's no judgment here. Um, we do have a ministry session. If you've been, if you've been uh, ministered to before and been set free from oppression and things, are healed, this is an opportunity to tell God thank you by, get, by paying it forward. So you can sit intercede if you never ministered with us before or you can or Olivia and I uh, we like to uh, be the spirit led and we'll, we may assign you to lead so but we do have one ministry session it's a younger girl uh, and it should be amazing because um, you know God's just God's just touching people and we, we just love seeing the maturity maturity in this church because because leaders in, in church the fivefold is to raise up people into the unity of Christ and into maturity so we're not tossed and turned or to and fro by different waves of doctrine. Does that make sense? So uh, it says that in scripture. I promise you it does. Okay. So with our church doing an evangelism event, I think this is a great opportunity to teach on evangelism. When I was first saved, I was an evangelist for the first five years of my life. I didn't know anything else. All I knew is Jesus saved me. I was grateful. Jesus told me to evangelize, and I did. Does that make sense? So I evangelized hardcore. But the way I evangelize is because I, I read the Bible a lot before I started doing it, and, the, and, the, and, and Jesus taught us to, to hear his voice. So I sought his face, and I said, Lord, where do you want me to go? I got in my car, drove to where he told me to go, and I said, who do you want to talk to? And I spoke to only who he wants to talk to. I, I don't teach shotgun evangelism. You know, I, some of y'all might be anti-guns, but you're in Texas. A shotgun evangelism, when a shotgun shoots, it's a bunch of BBs, <laughs> like Hundreds of BBs or a thousand BBs will come out, especially if you're shooting a bird, right? Um, you don't do shotgun evangelism. You don't go out there and hit up every single person that walks path, past you because the success rate is going to be very low. The goal is to speak to who God is speaking to, who God has, 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 um, has, has drawn to you or you drawn you to them. So the title of today's teaching is going to be Evangelism, the Catalyst. Evangelism, the catalyst. How many of y'all know Larry Taylor? Okay. All y'all have heard of Larry Taylor. He's the spiritual father of Olivia's and I. He's our personal pastor. So he's been absolutely amazing in our life. So last year, around this time last year, he sends me a message. Hey, Jonathan, we can't afford y'all to come out, but God put it on our heart to have a tent revival. And, and then God also instructed us to reach out to our Houston folks, which is y'all. And I said, you don't have to pay us? We'll come out. So a group of us went out there. Holly was there, Olivia and I were there, and a, a big group from Houston went out there. The, the goal was to do this tent revival and evangelize the city. There was a car show. They have uh, two or three major events there. A car show, pretty cool. I'm not big on cars, but uh, I know some guys are, some girls are, but I'm not. Uh, there was a car show, and they have what I want to do one day is their uh, food truck. It's the largest <laughs> food truck it's the largest food truck event in the U.S. It's in Graham. And uh, I like food. <laughs> and that's, that's typically what, that's my agreement with God. I said, wherever you want me to go, as long as there's good food. Just dangle a, a, dangle a steak in front of me and I'll make it. Um, but anyways, we went there for this car show. Larry said, hey, would you lead a, an evangelism group? So we, we went out and started evangelizing. We had I evangelized eight little girls, literally little girls, like nine and under. On the get-go, they all received Christ. They were selling little bottles of water. And I walked up. The, the oldest was a nine-year-old, very spunky. I walked up to him. I said, hey, I said, I said have, have y'all have, have heard about Jesus Christ? And they all kind of looked at me. She goes, what do you want, this little girl? And I said, I said, let me tell you some things that I, I've seen Jesus do. And she goes, okay. And I started telling her, testifying the things I've seen Jesus do, the healings and things. And all of a sudden, one girl got up and said, with God, all things are possible, like a little, like a six-year-old. And I said, that's right. She said, I have Jesus in my heart. And I was like, that's good. I have Jesus in my heart, too. And I said, 
And, and, and one girl goes, that's impossible with us. And I said, you want to know something else? I wasn't a Christian. Jesus came and chased me down. And the moment I received him as, a, as my Lord and Savior, he started healing the sick and other amazing things. I didn't even talk about demons to these little kids. And one little girl goes, so can we do that? And I said, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And Olivia's watching, and these, all the girls goes, all, like, eight of them went, we want Jesus in our heart. And I went, good. And then, and then you can start praying for the sick. I said, don't be upset. The first one doesn't get healed. Because the first one I prayed for did, uh, the first one I prayed for did, but the next five did not. And I said, but the goal is to pray and keep on praying. And I said, and then you're going to see greater miracles than Olivia and I have ever seen. And they close their eyes. We see Christ. Um, I had a chance, though, to, uh, to hijack a, uh, the car show, like, like, band stage. And where God, God just directed us to go out there, speak to a man that was head, who's a friend of ours now, who is a complete stranger. God led me right to this guy, opened the stage up, let us give us an opportunity to preach for five minutes the gospel of Jesus Christ. And over 2,500 people in that was there at the show at that time heard the gospel. It hit every single speaker. But God just does amazing and miraculous things. When you're about the Father's business, he begins to open those doors for you. So what's happening now in Graham? Larry messaged us the other day and said, all the churches in Graham, Texas, have gotten together and started doing worship events. All the churches. Baptist, uh, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, I don't know all of them. Church of Christ. Church of Christ paid for the tent. Right? The Baptists, the Southern Baptists, the Southern Pentecostal, the Southern whatever. I, I have no idea all these. But they're all gathered. I think 13 different churches started gathering and worshiping Jesus together in unity in that city. I'm not saying it was because of that one event. There was, there's been, a, there's been a, a deluge of events happening right after that. But that, w- that was the trickle that, that started the wave. And God is, God is touching people. God is reaching people. What's going on in this world that I shared last, last week? The world is desperate for a savior. When there is wars and rumors of wars, nations coming against nations, death, disaster, pain, that's a ripe harvest. So what I've learned is the greatest evangelists are the ones who haven't forgotten the, co- con- the, conditions, the condition of their heart when they encounter Jesus. So they're, they're evangelizing not out of a place of obligation or anger or condemnation. The worst are the, are the people who evangelize out of condemnation. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But... Um, but those, those people who are evangelizing from a gratefulness of their heart and saying, God, what Jesus did for me, he wants to do for everyone I encounter. And you're evangelizing from that gratefulness of love. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. First Peter says this. I'm reading, I think, all from King James, a new King James. First Peter 3, 15, 3, 15, First Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready. How often should you be ready? Always. always. Be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for your hope, the hope that's in you, with meekness and fear. Evangelism gives us an opportunity to give personal testimonies of God's unwavering and unconditional goodness, his hope, his mercy, his grace, his faith, and his love. When we're out there, you're a living testament of God's greatness, God's goodness, his love. So when you begin to share what Jesus, you've seen Jesus do and where he brought you from, those who are in the same position will instantly, their, their spirit will instantly wake up and go, whoa, I need that and I want that. I remember my older brother. Uh, he's been saved like four times. But my older brother, one day he looked at me and he says, how are you so forgiving? How are you so loving? How come you're not bitter at me? And I told him about Jesus. He said, if Jesus Christ can, can set you free from those things, I want him. And this is during a time where some of the greatest trials of his life were revealed as a child. And I remember hearing that. I went, whoa, my life is the gospel of Christ. There's the gospel of Jesus Christ, his, his life and what he did. But our lives, what he did for us personally, is the gospel. Repentance is, is grace. The Lord told me that last week. The ability to repent is grace. 
The ability to turn away from sin, turn away from bad things is grace. That's the definition of grace, the Lord says. The Lord said the man has a definition of grace, but my definition, oh no, my, man has definition of repentance. My definition is grace. And I went, whoa, that's deep, Lord. And I had to sit there and go, thank God I'm saved by grace. I'm saved with the ability to turn away from my wickedness, because we've all fallen short, and turn towards a Savior. And be reconciled with the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth. It's amazing. John chapter 3, I'm going to read 16 and 17. John chapter 3, 16 and 17. This is Jesus speaking. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Y'all know the scripture that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Does it say whoever believes in him is going to be condemned? Does it say those who don't believe in him will be condemned to hell? It's saying he's coming after the world. For God did not send his son into the world to what? To not condemn the world, but that he, that the world would through him might be saved. I think a lot of evangelists, when I got evangelized by two of my good friends in college, that's how they started. You're going to hell. <laughs> Buddha's, Buddha's a statue. I'm like, well, you have a cross with a dead man on it. Jesus wrote, apparently, according to you, he rose. Why is there, why is there, why is, why are you wearing a cross with Jesus on it then? If he's not on the cross anymore, I said. And they went, well, it's different because Jesus actually lived and he's still alive. And I said, Buddha lived. Have you, have you even researched Buddhism? Like they were, con they were, although it was 100% truth, it wasn't truth in love. It was truth with, with, uh, with uh, their, uh, their agenda was to be right. And when your agenda is to be right, your agenda isn't love, you're wrong. And a lot of people were, were evangelizing me that way. We were, they would say, let me take you out to eat. In college, you're broke. So I was like, all right, whatever. They said, what, right, what do you want to eat? I was a Vietnamese food. So I'm eating, and they're like, we want to, we, where are you going to go when you, when, you, when you die? And I'm like, you've asked me this question last week while we're eating tacos. I told you, I don't want to hear about your Jesus because you're telling me Jesus is sending me to hell. But you know when I got saved, what, who I encountered? A good God, a good father, and his goodness. Suddenly, my, my heart changed, and I went, whoa, I need that. You all see the difference? It's, it was completely different. So whenever you share the gospel, you must keep in mind and be convinced in your heart that the truth is found in this. Romans 2, 4. The truth is, here's the truth in Romans 2, 4. It's going to be the second part of Romans 2, 4. The goodness of God leads hearts to repentance. The goodness of God leads hearts to repentance. It wasn't until I encountered his goodness that I truly repented. Because I realized his goodness was something I couldn't earn. And I'm sitting here looking at my life, a druggie, a womanizer, suicidal, murderous mind had all these thoughts in my mind and i was like whoa this god jesus christ this man son of god looked at me and said worthy of death worthy of the cross worthy now that that's pure goodness because i've been thinking if i was the judge I would have condemned me to hell, which is where I was going. How many of us, if we were the judge, so stuff that's happening in, in Israel right now, when you heard about little babies, I don't want to talk about everything that's happened, but being destroyed. Our first thought as man is like, let's kill those people. They're evil. I thought that, and I'm a pastor. And my next thought was, wait, Jonathan, you're wrong. Pray for their salvation. If, if their hearts can turn to you, Lord, save them. If their hearts can't, protect, protect the innocent. Because his vengeance, it should be scary to the enemy. My vengeance probably doesn't scare the enemy at all. Because when I, when I pursue vengeance, then I'm partnering with the devil. Because Jesus is our vengeance. The Lord is our vengeance. Does that make sense? So we can either partner the devil with our vengeance or, part, or allow the Lord to be our vengeance. And the Lord's vengeance isn't towards the person, but 
towards the spirits affecting that person and the king of those spirits. And salvation is the greatest victory. It's a change in mindset, those strongholds. I grew up in a violent, violent life, right? I don't know how many, the rest of you grew up in violent. I don't know, Kendrick and I grew up, our lives kind of were very different, but, but they overlap. There's a lot of violence in our lives. But, but growing up in a violent life, you, you tend to think violently. But a violent Christian is a, is a Christian who thinks in love. And a, is a Christian who not, does not have idle hands. So when I got evangelized in college, I remember like I was sharing earlier, they would take me out for coffee, to, to, uh, they would take me out to Whataburger, they would take me out with all these stuff with the agenda to get me saved. Because they said, you have such a good heart. Well, un- until one, day, one time they saw me fight. And like half my friends in college freaked out. We were out for my birthday and someone stole my parking spot. Um, and I literally called a hit on, on the car and I wanted to see it burn, I said. I just, just recorded it. The lives you owe me, because I saved a lot of people from murder. I said, the lives you owe me will be wiped out. If you two steal this car from me and destroy it. And the man comes out, destroy him too. But if all I want is the car, I said. And all my friends looked at me and went, who are you? You're the nice Jonathan. What are you talking about? I said, I grew up on the streets. Are you kidding me? He stole my spot, and then he flicked me off, and then he picked up a beer bottle to attack me. He's lucky I didn't snap his neck. And I said, all I'm, I'm not trying to kill him. All I want is his car burned in, in, a, in, in, in a field. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. I have professionals I know that, that can take the car, I said. They flipped out, wouldn't even speak to me again. And I, and I didn't understand why until I became a Christian. Like, two months later, I became a, became a Christian, and I was like, oh... Yeah, yeah, that's, that probably wasn't Jesus or God at all. <laughs> so why should, we, why should every believer evangelize? We evangelize not because we need more testimonies. When you evangelize, you're going to get testimony, but you don't need more testimony. You don't need more notches in your belt of people saved. You don't, you don't evangelize to be seen online. You see that all the time. If God tells you to record something, cool, do it. But not every instance you serve the Lord is going to be recorded because that's going to be your only reward. The applause, the likes, the shares. They're going to be like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. And, and then when you get to heaven, you're like, what about these 16,000 things I did? And the Lord said, you got the applause of man. Yeah, it, 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 that doesn't mean you're not going to be saved. You're not going to heaven. And then you're going to look over at someone who never did any of that and go, why is his, why is his um, mansion so big. Why is your pool on every deck? <laughs> I like swimming pools. I like swimming. So my, my house would have a swimming pool on every deck. Maybe a hot tub too. But I, I like water. Water relaxes me. And our agenda, I said this to our, to our, our team that's going to go out next week. Our agenda is not to fill a church. You're not filling this church. You're not going out to fill this church. The agenda of evangelism is to fill heaven, Amen. right? I, I did pass out cards here, but what I told our team is, tell everyone who comes out and evangelizes, don't just give out the card woe wo nilly. I think that's the right, willy nilly. <laughs> well, whoever willy is, uh, I tried. Um, I'm Chinese, so it's woe nilly in China. Um, <laughs> but I said, everyone, y- y'all should grab a stack of cards and take it with you, 10 or 20. But don't just give them out willy-nilly, but only to those who say, hey, I don't have a church. Where's your church? Because my, our agenda going out there is Jesus. It's love, and it's filling heaven. Does that make sense? It's not to fill our church. It's not to fill all the churches, although everyone should go to our church. And that's a good question to ask people. People, I'm a Christian, so, so how is your relationship with Jesus? Good. Have you, do you need prayer for anything, right? Like, yeah, as you're going through this, this, this conversation with these people, you're having a normal conversation. The, the conversation about Christ should be normal. It should be, in a, it should be a normalized thing that happens in our life. We evangelize because we are a witness of God's goodness. 
You witnessed it. A woman who witnessed it in the Bible was a woman at the well. Jesus came, knew everything about her. She was discarded by by five husbands. She was discarded and rejected by the entire city. And then she was staying with a man who was not her husband because no one else would marry her. And then she encountered God's goodness and became a witness, evangelized the whole city. History shows that that woman was used as a catalyst for the salvation of that entire city. Stories actually roll out there and that says that she started going from city to city, village to village, preaching the gospel right after encountering Jesus, before the cross. That should be the response of our heart. I remember the Lord says to me, huh, you've, you stopped sharing my gospel. And I'm like, I preach every Sunday. He, God said, I used, I, you used to hear my voice and go out and just pour out to whoever I, I want. So Olivia and I said, you know what? We should be intentional about this again. But not just for this season, all the time. Lord, you all going out to the movies? Lord, if there's someone here, bring them to my attention. Pull on my heart. You go out to Walmart, there's a lot of people there. <laughs> Lord, which one of these people are the ones, <laughs> right? Because you can talk to everyone. For some reason, Walmart is, a, is, a, is full of depressed people, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because I used to go there drunk before salvation. I used to walk over there, my cousin's drunk to get sober, playing with all the toys. Especially the, the Tickle Me Elmo and the, and the Jumping Tigger. I clicked every ju- tump- Jumping Tigger's head. And they all jumped off of the, the, ca- the, the shelves. Um, it was, it was something you did when you were young and stupid and had nothing, nothing to live for. So the agenda of evangelism and all ministry isn't, the sol- isn't solely salvation, but rather to reveal the love of God and to release the encounter with, encounters with Jesus. And if God opens that door to lead them individually or corporately into salvation, Olivia and I we, and our team, when we traveled a lot last year, we evangelized churches because there's a lot of unsaved in churches, which tells me when we go out, when y'all go out, you're going to hear people say, I'm a Christian. But 50% of Christians in churches, and not 80%, depending on the size of the church, are lukewarm or unsaved. So your job is to go out there and, sh- and demonstrate what a burning hot Christian looks like. A loving burning hot Christian, and to demonstrate what a true believer looks like. I'm not here to convict you. I'm convicting myself. Like, I'm like, man, I need to do more of this when I go out. Like, preaching to y'all is great. This is like 40 people, and then then throughout the, the week, we'll get another 70, 80, like, YouTube watchers. Wow, great, whatever. But am I actively listening to the Holy Spirit and pursuing who he's leading me to? Evangelism is intentional, right? People who are watching are watching probably because they're saved and they're trying to find what Jesus is talking about. So people are being drawn to you. Like when you start a ministry, I may preach on that one day. When, you st- when, when God launches a ministry, God wants you to start something. He'll draw people to you without your efforts. But when you evangelize, God will draw you to them. Because the world it's, it's easy to look at the world and say it sucks. It's broken. There's pain. There's turmoil. There's death. You're, you're watching literally dead people walking around. I remember hearing about Israel. My first thought was, man, we, the Hamas needs to be crushed. And my next thought from Jesus was, those are souls. The ones that were destroyed in Israel are souls. A lot of them aren't Messianic Jews. Masonic. No, ma- Masonic. Masonic Jews, because they're not Masonic. Uh, Masonic Jews. Now, a lot of them were just Jews who did not know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I think as Christians, it's time for us to start looking at the world differently and, uh, and the calling from Jesus differently. And while, and while we're doing the work of ministry, which is Jesus taught and demonstrated, he told us to do the works of ministry. While we're doing the works of ministry, we must never forget the condition, the condition we were in when we encountered the love of Jesus Christ. Gratefulness 
remembers who we were and what we were doing when Jesus first touched us. Me, I was literally about to shoot myself. When those two girls knocked on my door, I was literally ready to tear a person I thought was carjacking them apart and then shoot myself. That's where I was at. I was hopeless. I was broken. I was lost. And I remember I talking to Jesus a few, a few months ago, beginning of the year, I think, and I went, gosh, it's been a while since a lot of things have happened. And Jesus said, do you remember who you were when you, when you encountered me? And suddenly begin to burn a, fr- a fresh fire in me, a fresh flame in me. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. First Corinthians 3, 6 to 8. Is this helping you all for evangelism? <laughs> Paul said this. I planted, he planted, right? Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. It's God is everything in this. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. So when you're sharing the gospel, you go out there not with an intent of reaping, sowing, or watering. You're being the hands and feet of Jesus, allowing him to, to decide what you're doing. So you're you're going out there, so some of y'all are going to be sowing. Some of you may be watering. Some of us may be harvesting that day. But Jesus Christ brings us salvation, the increase. The increase he's talking about is the increase in the heaven. Only God can bring the increase. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring the increase. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. This one, the next three are NASB. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. So what is the gospel? The power of God. What happened with the the disciples when they got endued with power? They rose up boldly and began to display power with love. So the gospel, for it is power of God, for salvation to, to everyone who believes, to the Jews first, Jesus went to the Jews first. And also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. How do you live by faith? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. So how do we live by faith as a Christian? Have the Holy Spirit in us. And hear the Holy Spirit and, and follow what, how he's leading you. For some, you may hear a voice. For some, you may have a thought. Some, some of y'all, you may look at somebody and go, that person looks like Olivia. What is it about Olivia you want me to talk about with this person? We walked up the, there, I picked up some free, like, I use, um, what is it, the, the toothbrush we use? That, uh, Sonic. I use a Sonic toothbrush. That's not, that's like more information you need to know. But, this, <laughs> the, but, the, but the brushes are expensive. And this one lady said her broke and she bought this like, eight pack she was giving it away so i was like let's pick it up because they're literally 15 dollars each she got eight pack i picked it up she came out she looked at my friend jennifer win a vietnamese win n-g-u-y-e-n so she gave it to me i said this is great thanks i said you remind me of, i said are you an attorney she said no i said you remind me of jennifer win she goes that's interesting before marriage my maiden name was w-y-n-n win coincidence no jesus was saying something about jennifer for her so i asked her if she need prayer for anything she said no i'm cool she said what are you i said i'm a christian she goes that's cool i respect christians i was like all right well if you ever need anything you can reach me on facebook thank you for these these, these things i said we've seen so many miracles she goes that's amazing i believe in miracles too she shook her hand she headed out seed sold and i sat down and i said she reminded me of jennifer she goes i thought the same thing i was like yeah, Jennifer Wynn. Guess what her last name was before marriage? She goes, she doesn't look Asian. I'm like, it was Wynn, but W-Y-N-N, a white person's name, right? But it, unless, unless black people and has that name too, but um, <laughs> maybe there's there are Hispanics out there that have Wynn. But she was, a, she was a white lady, and my friend Jennifer obviously was not a white person. Um, so as we're going about, y'all are laughing. I'm t- I don't know. I'm unfiltered, right? So, um, okay. 
So it's important when you were going out that er, to, to keep in mind that every Christian <coughs> was given the Great Commission. Every Christian. It wasn't just the five offices. It wasn't just that apostles, pa- prophets, teachers, evangelists, and, and, and um, pastors. No, it was Christians. The believers were given the full commission. What is the full commission? You'll find that in Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. I'm going to read 16 to 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus has designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word disciple is a follower of Jesus, not a follower of you. We're making disciples here for y'all to follow Jesus. Tammy and I were just talking the other day. I said, if you're following me, you're you're following wrong. You can imitate me if you're a brand new Christian as I imitate Jesus. That's in the Bible because I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's been walking with Jesus for two decades. But... At some point, I, as your leader, should be always pointing you back towards the Holy Spirit for your relationship, your walk, your personal relationship with God. Because one day, I'm older than some of y'all, one day I'm not going to be around. And and then you're going to be lost if you just follow the man. Does that make sense? And it's so important as, as Christians to have leaders in your life that points you to hear, to seek Jesus for themselves, that hold you accountable what they hear, who are willing to, to even correct you if what you're hearing is not biblical, right? So it's important to have that, to have, have that um, what is it called? To have that accountability in your life as well. But it's not my job to be the voice of Jesus for you. Earlier in my walk, the other like six Bible studies I had before launching a church, the, every time it grew, people started acting odd. They said, what is God saying for me today? Where is my sock? Literally, they had that call. I'm trying to wear my red sock. I'm missing one. I was like, it's probably in your dryer, or your dryer ate it. Like, I don't, like, and she said, I'm missing my necklace. I was like, when, when was the last time you wore it? Like, these people will call me for, for silly things. And then I realized, whoa, wait, why are they, why are they coming to me to hear Jesus? I'm training them to hear Jesus for themselves. And it's so important as Christians to have leaders that point you to Christ for you to have a relationship. And what's going to happen in, 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 in the leaders of your life, we'll be confirming that. Tammy and I were just talking about confirmation. We'll be confirming that. The prophetic voices are in your life, the other prophetic voices, because you're prophetic. We should be confirming what you've already heard Jesus direct you to do. And it's so important that no, no one person here becomes the sole voice of God for anybody. And, it, and if, if people start to act that way, and act belligerent, this is just a warning now. It's not in here. The people, so leaders are acting belligerent and saying, you have to do exactly what I tell you to do. There's honoring authority. I get it. Over here, I'm the authority. I'm like, y'all, y'all can't, can't pump up my our baptismal pool and swim in it right now, right? That's cool. But if the Holy Spirit tells you, hey, go home, fill your bathtub up and baptize yourself, do it. Right? It's, it's not unbiblical. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? So before a person can become a disciple they, they, and follow Jesus, which means follower of Jesus, they must first become a believer in him through hearing the gospel and uh, many times through evangelism. That's where they hear the gospel the first time. I only had two people try to, try to evangelize me but never told me the gospel. They said, we love you. We don't want you to go to hell. Jesus is the way. Uh, why is he the way? Why would I want to follow your God, I thought. Like, you have, you have nothing else to tell me about Jesus? And they didn't. Well, the Bible says so. I'm Buddhist. I have Buddhist manuscripts I memorized. I'm like, okay, tell me about the Bible. And they couldn't. And I was like, look, if y'all can't tell me why Jesus is superior which Jesus doesn't come here and say he's superior. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I was like, if Jesus is superior to, to, to my gods, because Buddha, there are multiple Buddhas, 
then why would I listen to you? And they couldn't, they could not give me a, a, a reason for their hope. One of the guys ended up being my roommate. He went to, he went to uh, Kenya with me. He comes back from the military. He wanted to go out and do what I taught him before salvation. Womanize, pick up, you pick up, pick up, you get, get drunk, and other things. And, and I said, I can't. He literally, he goes, but I'm back. Like, let's go out and do this. Like, old time, I was like, I can't. I'm a Christian. I have two Bible studies tomorrow. He goes, but tomorrow's Saturday. I'm like, yeah. Well, I said, you want to come? You're a Christian, right? Yeah, I'm a Christian. He goes, who's teaching? And I said, both Bible studies, I am. He said, well, you've been a Christian for like six months. And I was like, but I have a story about Jesus to tell. And I've been reading the Bible, and Jesus has been talking to me. I said, he goes, what are you doing tonight then? It's Friday night. And I said, my Bible study is going out to um, feed the homeless and pray for some sick people. And he goes, you know what? I'll go out with you. Then he saw like 16 to 17 people get healed on the spot. And afterwards, I didn't know it was wrecking him because I thought he was a Christian. I thought every Christian was the same. It was wrecking him. And, and then our group of like 15 to 20 people, they're, they were accustomed to it, demonstrating the gospel, showing love. We passed out two or 300 sandwiches. Just loving on them. We, we literally had a, had a rock concert, a Christian rock concert, in the middle of a, of a parking strip in downtown. We would park, pull out our speakers, plug it into the truck, turn on, turn on, and then all my friends would plug in, and we're just worshiping, and people are coming. And, and we always offer prayer. We never force Jesus on their throat. And after six, six meetings in a row, a guy walks up to me and says, thank you for not trying to force me to convert. I'm a Muslim. And I went, okay. And he had this, like, quarter. I think it's quarter. Is that what it's called? Like a, t a big cancer on his face. And he said, um, because you haven't, you haven't come with an agenda, I want to hear about your Jesus, because why, why are you doing this for us? And I said, can we pray for that quarter? This was when Patrick was with me. I reached out, touched it, and I said, and, and it started to shrink. And I remember looking at it, and I was like, hey, is it? Like, before I started praying, and he, Patrick is looking at me, his eyes were watering over, and I was watching it shrink. And it shrank about half the size. And he's looking at me going, he's watching my thumb get closer to his face. I see him doing this. And I said, obviously, I think Jesus wants to encounter you today. Uh, and I said, I'm a brand new Christian. Um, he probably knows more, I said. And Patrick was like, no. Nah. And I went, um, well, let me continue to pray and see how small we can make this thing. And he reaches out and touches it. And he goes, this is all I ask Jesus. This is all I ask God for. My Allah, he said, is for it to be half the size because people stare at me. I figured half the size would make people stop staring at me with, with fear. It literally shrank half the size. And I'm looking at him, and I was like, well, Jesus saved me from, he goes, I want your God. And Patrick is looking at me going, my six-month-old Christian friend who was Buddhist and a womanizer and a druggie and, and suicidal, I leave for the military for basic training. I come back, and the sick are being healed. Like, he's freaking out internally. I didn't even know this. So we lead him to Christ. We lead three people to Christ, right? And then well, everyone who saw his, his face ran up. It was 15 to 17 people ran up, and they all got healed that day. That was the first time they all, er, everyone healed. Like, literally 50%, 80% people get healed. They're all healed. So we get in the car, and Patrick was speechless. Patrick, uh, Olivia knows him. He's not speechless. He's like me. He put, he put us together. We're talking about two completely separate topics, listening to each other. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say something. That's sexist. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking, ladies. Um, but, but we have that skill of talking about two completely separate topics and, and really listening to each other, responding, and still talking about two separate topics. So we get in the car. We get back home. He's sleeping on my couch for that time, and then I go to bed, and I wake up, and I'm hearing crying in my room. He's sitting on the chair next to my bed. Flips me out because I'm not used to someone in my room. And I look up, and I was like, dude, what are you doing? What, what are you, dude, what are you doing? And he goes, I knew it was, I knew it, I knew there was more. I knew there was more. I knew there was more. And I sat up, I was like, 
more of what? And he goes, Jesus, I knew there was more to the gospel because Jesus told us to do things. And I knew, I, I always knew there was more. And so Jesus is like fully real. And Jesus is wanting to do things. And he, and he, he used my Buddhist friend to, to show me. And I went, I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not a Buddhist. We could talk about this tomorrow. We have, I have two Bible studies. Can you, can you get out and let me sleep? And he goes, can we do this again? I was like, tomorrow morning, let's do it again, just you and me. He goes, well, when miracles happen, I was like, I'm going to have you pray, which is everyone here and everybody knows that's my personality. I said, we're going to go out. You're going to pray because you're going to realize it's not Jonathan. I was like, I, I don't even know how, how he's healing. It just, he just says he's going to heal in the Bible. And he goes, you just believed him? I'm like, yeah. And you didn't? He was raised with a Southern Baptist pastor father. And he's heard about miracles, never physically seen it. And then that day blew his mind. And that moment on, boom, he was on fire for God. He went out, got three or four days a week, more than I did, and started evangelizing everywhere. Because he was back from the military, so he was got going everywhere. He came back, he was like, 40 healings, 10 healings, four salvations. He was like, it's amazing. Jesus actually is using me. And I was like, you lived a really pure life until you met me. And I was like, so I'm not surprised he's using you. Your heart's pure. And I'm sorry I defiled you. And he goes, bro, if that didn't happen to me, I wouldn't have realized how good he is because he's using me because I did bad stuff in spite of it. And he began to, to, to tell me as a Christian what the gospel really is. We've all fallen short. Some of us here will, 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 can tell you, before Christ started using them, they thought they were disqualified. They disqualified themselves. The enemy is whispering to them, saying, you don't, they don't know what you did 10 years ago. Right? They don't know the thoughts you had in your mind before salvation. I had a lot of thoughts of murder all the time. And I'm telling you, Jesus, not that he's forgotten it, He'll forgive you for it and then wipe it clean and then forget it, right? The repentance is needed. But the repentance is so easy of saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn completely away from doing this and not do it again. And Jesus goes, all right, Connor, it's done. And you go, Jesus, again, I'm sorry for it. He goes, wait, wait, I, I, don't, I don't even remember what you're apologizing me, apologizing for. He's, he's literally that good. The moment you apologize, the moment he forgives you, then he forgets your, your transgressions. He forgets them. And like, it, as, a, as a Buddhist coming, out of Christian, coming into Christianity, I was shocked. And I would cry and cry and cry every week, rep repenting for the same things over and over until he told me he forgave me the first time. Like, he goes, I don't remember what you're, what you're apologizing for. That, that's never happened in your history. I'm looking at your history right now. There's no history of this. And I had to talk to a Christian friend. He goes, dude, you haven't read that part in your Bible? I was like, no. And he goes, he wiped out your transgressions. You're as white as snow. He forgave you. That he's, he's, he's faithful to forgive. As far, he's, when he forgives you, he's as far as the east is from the west. And I said, that makes no sense because the east never meets the west. And he goes, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, I'm a brand new Christian at that point. And I was like, but why would he do that? I, I did nothing. And he goes, you received them. That makes no sense. And that's, that's the gospel the world needs to hear. Share your life when you're out there. When you meet somebody and you go, dude, I'm such a fornicator. I'm addicted to porn and drugs. He's like, you know what? I was too. Until my mom delivered me. I was too. I'm saying that because a man in here shared his testimony online like, Publicly, it was amazing, that, that, that transparency. Y'all have seen it, the ministry here, right? And how transparent we've, we are as ministering, we. And how it affects the person we're ministering to. But someone literally ministered to someone on Friday. She's sharing all these things. And I was like, wow, I'm sorry you went through all these things. I got good news for you. I did too. She was like, what? I went through this, 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 and this. And then Jesus healed me. Jesus set me free. And then he, and he suddenly used, and he used me immediately. And I was like, even before I was totally healed, he started using me. And sh all of a sudden, I said, how does that make you feel? Very hopeful. 
That's the beauty of the gospel. When you're out there, testify. That's the beauty of the gospel. If you grew up in religion, and all of a sudden you encounter the fullness of Christ, right? Olivia didn't grow up in total religion, but when she encountered Jesus in 2010, in a greater measure, she was saved at a very young age as a child. But all of a sudden this greater measure came, she goes, OMG, I don't think I know anything about Jesus now. Like, if that's possible, what else is possible, right? I know there, there's some ladies here that text Olivia with the same experience saying, I grew up in church. I didn't even know this was possible. And she shared that with me, with some of, those, some of the testimonies and excitement. And I'm like, That's, that warms a pastor's heart. Like, we celebrate. We're like, oh, yeah, this person, this person gets it. And they're ministering out of grat- uh, uh, gratitude and love and gratefulness, right, instead of pride. The religious will minister out of pride. The religious will evangelize out of pride for their gain. I was sharing this yesterday with some friends. I said, the Lord says, because I was talking to the Lord about something, and he said, huh, when did your prayers become, prayers to me, become only getting something for you? We should pray for ourselves, because we're not idiots. Jesus is listening. But if all your prayers are only about yourself, my, my, my first pastor said this to me, do you know what prayer is? Two-way communication talking to Jesus. How do you pray all the time? Talk to Jesus all day long. He goes, it's not getting on your face and praying, although there's a place for that. He says, you talk to Jesus all day long. And as a young Christian, I went, I can do that because I can't stop talking. (laughs) Right? It's true. Some of y'all are like, yeah, it's true. See, Rhonda's afraid to nod her head. She's like, it's totally true. And, but, but in that, in that place, all of a sudden he's, and he says, but don't forget to listen. And I was like, talk to them all day long and listen to them all day long. I can do that. That was such an invaluable, that, like priceless. That was such a priceless lesson when he explained that to me. How do you pray without ceasing? Include Jesus in everything. And when I started doing that, my relationship started growing. And my prayers were crafted for people. 80, 90% of the time and me, 10 to 20% of the time. I was praying for salvation of my family. And then I saw it, and then all of a sudden, I shared this yesterday with some friends as well. I, it, it, my prayers became, Jesus, you're amazing. I'm just coming to you to tell you thank you. Gosh, you are so good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for still using me. Thank you so much for correcting me. He, he chastises those he loves. And that's one thing I learned at a young Christian. I was like, oh, my gosh, I think I just got corrected. And I'm like, you know what? That means he still loves me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me enough to correct me. And do it again if needed. A lot of people think correction because our parents probably did it wrong. Um, nothing wrong with my parents. But they, my, my mom's correction had a bamboo stick or a baseball bat. So God's correction is like, boom, Josiah, I love you, son. You're greater than this. That doesn't define you. Are you willing to repent? And if you do, I'll forget it. And after that, let's get back on the bike and have a good time. It's, it sounds so simple, but it's so real that when we're out and we're sharing the gospel, that's the thing. I've been trying to follow Jesus, but it's impossible. I've had people say that to me, and I'm like, you're right, it's impossible, but his grace is sufficient. But his grace isn't for me to sin. You're right. His grace isn't for you to sin, but his grace, his grace gives you the ability to repent every time you've fallen short. You don't yank that grace. The grace isn't a sin, a, a, a sin approval card. It's a, it's a love approved. And then where you're weak, he's strong. So it sounds as though you're very weak right now in these things. Now Jesus has the opportunity to be stronger. And these are Christians who know the word. They were like, you don't have to preach to me. And I'm like, no, I'm sharing the truth to you because God wants to set you free today because you know this truth, but at some point, you, never, you stop believing it. I'm not here to argue with Christ, the, the Bible. I'm here to reveal truth. I have more success with Christians or lukewarm Christians or churchgoers. Don't know why. 
Paul was, Paul, Paul was sent to the Gentiles, <laughs> right? Peter was sent to the Jews. So I'm Peter. I'm like, this ex-Buddhist dude is being sent to the, Christ, to the Christian church? Cool. If, it was, if, if God could use Peter for it, for the Jews, God can use Jonathan for the church. Some of y'all grew up in straight religion, and God delivered you from it. God may be calling you to the streets of the unsaved. It may be the office. I'm not saying it's a given rule, but it made sense to me. Olivia brought it up to me one day. I'm like, I don't know why God's having me evangelize churches. Like, I came out of Buddhism. Olivia goes, because God had Peter minister to the Jews. And I went, huh, okay. It's good for Peter. It's good for Jonathan, because obviously Jesus trusted him. So Proverbs 11.30 says this. He who is wise wins souls. Say, I'm wise. Then your, your job is to win souls. Now, let's, let's tackle some, some lies. Some of y'all may say, Jonathan, I'm not an evangelist. True. A few of us are true office of evangelist. You may say, I'm shy. That's not an excuse. You have Jesus. You may say, I'd rather leave evangelism to the professional evangelist. But Jesus tells us to preach the gospel. He tells us to preach the gospel. The truth is, only a few are actually in the office of, right? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor. Only a few of us are in the office of. There's a lot of leaders in churches. But the offices weren't established by Jesus to, do, to be the only ones doing the work. Their work is to equip us to do the work of ministry. Their work is to, is to raise us up into unity and maturity. What's happening in Graham right now? There's a unity in the entire city. And it started with a, a small tent revival, four, four services, and, a, and a, a day of evangelism. Olivia, Holly, and I, and like two other people, we went door to door. Every, er, the whole city was, was in the square. We decided to go door to door, like 40 doors. I think five of them opened because we, then one day a, a lady goes, oh, you're going door to door, you realize we're all in the square, right? And I was like, it's 112 degrees right now. God, couldn't you have told me that with the first door that opened? But it was hilarious. Like, that's where we're like, because uh, the people there are like, you all should go door to door. Without asking the Holy Spirit, I'll admit I didn't. I was like, okay. Never done door to door before. That sounds fun. Like, I like to challenge myself in everything. And we went door to door. After that moment, I was like, mm. And Holly was about to pass out. She goes, guys, I'm not feeling good. And I was like, it's 112 degrees, and, and none of us are feeling good. I was like, let's just go back, get some water and see what happens. And we went back, and that's when we got on stage started preaching the gospel. So what are the works of ministry? Everything Jesus did, including winning souls. Right? Winning souls is one of the works of ministry. Evangelism is a commandment for all followers of Jesus to do. The harvest is ripe, and sadly, we shared this last week, sadly, the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few because, because we forgot our work. Not work as in religious work, but work as in letting our faith have action. Right? It says faith without works is dead. So let our faith show, let our works confirm our faith. The work of evangelism releases the grace of Jesus and the faith needed for miracles and salvation. I can tell you, every time we go out, miracles are happening. Why? Because Jesus wants souls. The signs are for the unbelievers. We get the reap of it because we're, we're part of the family of believers. But the signs are for to help the unbelievers believe. Be willing to pray for the sick, pray, pray for the blind. Be willing, be willing to fail for Jesus. That's the greatest t way of learning. But also... Be humble enough to succeed for Jesus. Mark 
chapter 16, verses 15 to 18. 18. This is Jesus. He says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creations. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. 30% of the healings Jesus, Jesus performed was rebuking a demon off of somebody, and he called it healing. They will speak in new tongues. So your tongues, praying in tongues, is a sign and wonder of Jesus. They will pick up serpents. Serpents could represent any ungodly thing. Like we could be around. It's not going to affect us. But don't go out searching for ungodly things. Right? If you, if you minister to somebody, I, I ministered to prostitutes when I first got saved. In the department I was in in Westheimer, I had no idea. Like half of them were, were women exotic dancers. Until the until first time I went to the pool. And I realized this is, this, the audience, the group here, it does not look like normal people. And I witnessed to them. And half of, half, of the, half of the people that went to the pool every day when I was working got saved. That's, that's picking up serpents. Because God led me to the people who needed to be touched by God. Even though I was, like, covering my eyes, praying over myself, like, like they, they had spirits on them. People in that, in prostitutes and in, in, in exotic dancers, they carry a spirit on them that a 20-something-year-old man shouldn't have been left alone. So I invited other women to come with me. We will sit there at the pool evangelizing. And there, many came, to, came to, to, to salvation. They will drink, and they, if, if, if they drink a deadly poison, curses and stuff, if they drink a deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they, when they lay hands on the sick, they will recover. Signs and wonders are for the unbeliever. So when we're out there, if someone says, will you pray for me? And God has you praying tongues first, pray in tongues first. Two things that get, that get me in the spirit, like really like the spirit of God increases on me and in me. Praying in tongues and worship. I was, I was sharing with some people yesterday, I was like, man, when y'all are worshiping, it takes me two or three songs for the Holy Spirit to really just increase. And I just feel the increase. And then at that moment, I can hear God crystal clear. Because God responds to gratefulness. Thanksgiving. He's like, oh, wow. This group is thanking me, and they're grateful. I'm going to give them the greatest gift of all, more of me. O only God can say that, right? If a man says that to you, I'm going to give you more of me, run. <laughs> but only God can say that. And we can say, like, yes. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, we had that 24-hour worship. How many of y'all, when you first got here, you just felt the atmosphere? I had people say, I almost fell out at the gate. The atmosphere was different because all of us came on a mission. I'm going to worship and praise Jesus. And I'm willing to sacrifice my sleep for it. And most of y'all, I think all of y'all, most of y'all fasted the whole time with us. So you're like, I'm going to sacrifice sleep and, and, every, and food, and I'm going to come out. And I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to give God a sacrifice offering of gratefulness and thanksgiving. And that atmosphere changed. I changed from that. I know Connor was saying, he, he, like, for a week or two, he was like, oh, my gosh. Like, his, the Holy Spirit was on him and, and just talking to him and, and, and pouring out more. And, and songs were, were coming up in him. It's like, that's what happens when, we, when we're all about him. The signs will always increase when you're preaching the pure gospel. When we live in a, a, evangelistic lives, we live with a cheerful, expectant heart. And we make room for Jesus to use us however he wishes. When I first went out, I had this preconceived notion, Jesus had to use me for healing. That's why we have so many healing stuff. But now I'm like, you know what, Jesus? I don't have a preconceived expectation anymore. Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. And use me however you want. When I was young, I felt like a child. I, very, I had preconceived agendas. Children have agendas, right? If I do this, I'm going to get this for Christmas. Unless you're Connor, you'll get anything you want. But I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, it's, it's true, right, Curtis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so when you're evangelizing, don't be afraid of rejection. Rejection will happen. I've been rejected multiple times, but a seed is sowed. Just as they walk away, go, thank you, Jesus. Something was sowed. A friend of ours, Erica, says she was, I think she was in Nevada or someplace. A lady gets out of an Uber. She walks over. She runs across the street. She starts evangelizing this girl who's, who, who just heard the gospel of Jesus for the first time. She was going to a, an adult entertainment place. Just heard the gospel for the first time from the Uber driver, and she rejected it. When Erica hit, boom, there was a harvest. An increase came. And she, was, she put it all over Facebook. That is amazing. And she gave Jesus all the credit. I love seeing people, mature Christians, do that. Give Jesus all the credit, saying, Jesus set this up for me perfectly. I was across the street. I saw this woman get out on an Uber, and God told me to go talk to her immediately. I ran over there, told her the same thing. The Uber driver just told her that she just rejected. She received Jesus, repented, was, was going to leave her job. Souls. The two, most, the, the two most valuable things for Jesus are souls and your hearts. He wants to, he, he's so much so he wants to heal your heart. So when you do get rejected, he's not rejecting you. Let's say you're prophesying as well to Christians. They're not rejecting you. They're just rejecting the spirit of God. Don't walk away offended and don't force feed them your prophetic word. Don't force feed them the gospel. I've had a lot of immature Christians, prophetic voices come up to me. Holly knows about this. Like she, she was part of a church, bef- a church that was all about prophecy once. It gets old. And then, and then when you say, I'm sorry, I don't think that's God, they'll go, it is God. I hear God. Well, if you were a mature Christ- prophetic voice, you'll believe I hear God too. It is my job to take your word to God to, to get confirmation. If it doesn't confirm, then I can walk away from it. And like people don't understand that in the prophetic. They want to force feed something. I had some, guy, some lady come to me and said, Jonathan's going to be in politics. And then a week later, I came and looked at Olivia. Has he started moving towards politics yet? Olivia goes, Jonathan said, I don't think that's, that's, that was God. And I don't think either. Well, it was, because I heard him. And Olivia's like, all right, well, you keep praying about Jesus and what he wants to talk to you, but we'll keep praying that we follow Jesus. <laughs> um, like, I've seen the politicians. Pastoring's hard enough. I don't want pol- to be a politician. <laughs> So we're called to occupy, multiply, and subdue the earth. Occupy the earth, multiply. You know the word occupy means doing business. All right, so an NASB actually says do business. So it reads this, NASB 1913 says, And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business. Other versions say occupy with this until I come back. That's a reflection of Jesus. Jesus is like, all right, I'm going to go so you can have the Holy Spirit. Right? He says, I have to go, but I'm going to come back. What is our job? To do business. What are most Christians doing? Sitting down and just receiving. I love receiving, especially food. I love receiving. But it's so, it's a mature Christian occupies, does business of his king until the king returns. A mature Christian does. And that's why when we evangelize Christians, the, our goal is to, is to show them the truth, what Jesus is calling them to do. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. So then tongues are for, the, are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is a sign not to unbelievers, but those who believe. John 4, 48. Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. But he's talking to an unbelieving group of followers, right? Like, you you need signs and wonders to believe? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is Paul. Probably the greatest 
Peter will argue this, but probably the greatest apostle of all time. I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not a persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Revelations 12, 11. And they, beca- they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. I didn't realize I didn't love my life until, until I, I, I ran into two different fires. A car fire right in my ditch when I was saved. And as a young Christ- uh, as a Buddhist at 15 years old, into an apartment fire. Everyone thought I was crazy. All I, all I saw was someone needed saving. The world's on fire. Are you willing to go into it and save them? You don't save them by, with eloquent speech. You save them with a demonstration of his love and power, with the preaching of the gospel. My family members got saved. A few of them got saved. One of them was very upset that I became a Christian bought my book in 2019 when I came out just to support financially support me, read it during COVID, and got saved. And then my other cousin, she saw me. I was going to the mega church here in Houston, and she, was, she started watching him online, and I was fresh out, out of it all. And then she said, you look like you have so much more peace. Like most of your anger is gone. I'd like to check, check out the, a church with you. So I brought her. She stood up and received salvation. And to this day, she's still a Christian. This was like 18 years ago. That, that cr- my, and, and the other day, I texted her happy birthday, and I said I love her. And she said, she said, thank you for introducing me to Jesus. That, she's, like, she's like, there's nothing else you, you ever need to do for me. You introduced me to Jesus. When we share the gospel, we need to also boldly testify with our own stories and with our, about our own journeys. Because no one wants to hear from someone who lives a perfect, lived a perfect life. Because the truth is there's only one who did. It's our imperfect lives and our imperfect nature without Jesus that will preach a, that will preach a stronger word. Your testimonies are a testament of God's goodness, sovereignty, power, love, and greatness, not of our own. I had a lot of religious people boldly and pridefully share their, their, their salvation story as though they had something to do with it. And they said, what about you? And I shared mine. They sat there and they went, you were mean to me. And I was like, did you not hear my story? I was about to die. Jesus is amazing. And those, those I don't want to say the dot denomination, those, those people started coming out to me to try to teach me how to minister the gospel, preach the gospel on the street and evangelize and to witness healings, salvations. Because they wanted to see me do it wrong first, they said, so they can show me how to do it right. And they, we sat down at, at a place called Fuzzy's Pizza, and I was like, I was a baby Christian, so I was like, tell me everything I did wrong. And they looked at each other. They had tears in their eyes. I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're about to, it was so bad, they're about to cry. <laughs> and they said, does that happen regularly? And I went, like, doing it that bad? I don't know. <laughs> like, right? And they went, no, the salvations and healings. Does that, that looks like Acts. And I was so new, I never, I never even got into Acts. So I was like, what kind of Acts? <laughs> and he said, Acts. I said, what do you? Like, like I'm thinking, I butchered them or something. And he said, the book of Acts. I said, there's a book called Acts in the Bible? I said, A-X. And they said, A-C-T-S, Acts. And I went, oh, okay. They said, wait, how f- where are you? I said, I'm reading Matthew, Luke, and John over and over. And I, I love John. I have read it like four times. And they said, have you read any other book? No. Uh, what should I, I guess I'll read Acts next, I said. And they said, Acts looks like it's coming alive. And I didn't even think those works were still relevant this day. Can we go out with you again? We went out, and they said, will you show us how you pray? 
And I said, I totally just rely on this Holy Spirit person. I pray and I wait for the Holy Spirit. And I pray what the Holy Spirit speaks. And I said, and then these things just happen. And they were like, I don't understand. And I was like, but y'all are Christians. They said, we, we, believe, we, know the Holy, we believe in the Holy Spirit because our denomination teaches about the Holy Spirit. But you're saying you hear the Holy Spirit and he's alive. I'm like, well, Jesus is alive, so the Holy Spirit's alive. And he's, he's supposed to be, I said, I read Acts now, so he's, been, he's in us and on us. And I said, and they're looking at me going, I said, so, so there's boldness and power. And I went, I said, why am I teaching you? Y'all have been Christians for 30 years. And they're, they went out and started praying and started happening, and they started evangelizing. Miracle signs and wonders started following them. Why? Because his word says. Not because they were great. You know what else increased? Their humility. Because they literally sat with me and they said, I can't do this alone. It has to be God. And I was like, what does your denomination teach you? <laughs> I was like, honestly, everything that's happening now is all God for me because I, I can't do it without him. I would be, I would be dead. And I said, I can't, the Lord told me to never forget that I would have killed myself that day if you didn't answer. The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus says, right? Jesus never asked anyone to repent to a kingdom that isn't tangible. He preached the kingdom, made it tangible. Their encounter with you and, and your testimony makes the unseen seen. And the unknown known becoming something they could also experience and turn to. Not just an ideology, a philosophy, or a thought system. Your testimony shares everything. You can say, I read this and prayed this, and this happened. I had no idea what to pray, and I prayed to Jesus, and I prayed in tongues, and then he answered. I, I texted my pastor or my friend, and I asked him to pray for me for this, and instantly got an answer. Like, I, I was about to commit suicide, and God saved me. I was addicted to porn, and the moment I asked for prayer from my mother, I was delivered. I was, I was hopelessly, hopelessly overcome by religion, the spirit of religion, which is wicked, the spirit of religion in pride, and it's gone. Like, I met people who were demonized, or I was demonized, and I was set free. I've seen the worst cases of things, of, of sicknesses healed. Like, those testimonies, people would go, whoa, hold up. I went out to a, we were, we were out at Willowbrook. I think it was Willowbrook. Went out to Willowbrook. First time we hung out with this other church, we, we did a co thing, went out. And we walked around, and then I'm walking with our, our friend JJ. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, have me look at these two Hispanic women sitting there. And it says, their feet hurt. And I'm like, their feet hurt? Both their feet? And I walked over, and I was like, hi, my name is Jonathan. And I said, can I pray for your feet? Your, your feet hurt. And they went, no. And I was like, do you speak English? Porquito. And then ended up both speaking perfect English. And I was like, okay. I said, JJ, you have la espanol? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, let's, start, let's do this. And I said, all right. I said, it's a shame that I can't pray for your feet. He translated and I said, because I've seen, at that point, five cases of stage four cancer healed, and now it's six. Six cases of stage four cancer healed. We've seen a man get out of a wheelchair who couldn't walk for 20 years. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. Uh, we started naming all these things. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, God bless you all. They went, wait. Th the lady on the left, or my, my left, she goes. <laughs> and, I, and I went, what? She goes, my, my feet hurt. And I said, really? So your right foot hurts more than your left. She goes. Yes. I said, this morning we woke up, your feet were hurting a lot. It was swollen. She said, yeah, it's your ankle. She said, yes. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to pray for your feet. And I prayed for her feet. And I looked at the next lady. I said, does pins and needles mean anything to your feet? Your feet hurt too. She goes, when I get up and when I, like when I lay down to sleep, she goes, I have diabetes. She says, I have a thing called neuropathy. Now she's speaking perfect English to me. <laughs> she's like, and I can't sleep because my feet are pins and needles all the way up to my knee. And I said, okay. I've seen neuropathy heal recently. You want that healed? She's like, yeah, we pray for her too. And I was like, typically we have them check them out. God says, don't. Have them check it out when you walk away. And I said, when I walk away, you stand up and check it out. I'm going to be meeting the group up in the cafeteria. 
God bless y'all. We walk out. We're standing in the cafeteria. This little old lady runs up and hugs me. Because she goes, where's Jonathan? Where's this guy? And they, they point at me. She comes up and hugs me. And I was like, I looked at her. She goes, my feet are healed. <laughs> and I was like, I told you there would be. And she goes, you're amazing. I was like, Jesus is so good that he, that he chose to use me to pray for your feet because he loves you. And she said, well, I have this pain in my back. It's my kidney. And I'm like, and the Lord said, no, it's, it's your muscle. And I said, it's your muscle right around your cartilage. And I said, it's right here. I touched it. And she goes, it's gone. Before praying, she moved. She goes, this is mind-blowing. I'm a Christian, she said, and I've never seen healing. And I said, well, that's a shame, but now you have. Now you go pray for the sick. And she goes, I can do that. I was like, all right. She goes, can I give you anything? I was like, no. Your gratefulness to Jesus is enough, but what you can do for me is go pray for the next sick person. And as it, and check with your friend later. Find out if her feet are healed tonight. They encountered Jesus. They encountered Jesus. We were like ecstatic. That day, JJ and I went and prayed for 16 people, 13 of them they need healing, all 13 healed. I'm telling you, at that point, it was rare to get all 100%, right? And I was like, we came back, we sat down with everyone, they said, we went out for testimonies, and they said, who has testimonies? And JJ goes, uh, he and I went out, um, a bunch of people got healed. They said, how many? 13. How many did you pray for for healing? 13. They said, completely healed? No. Completely healed. And why? And I said, guys, God healed them all because he's good. And what he's doing for me, he wants to do for all y'all. And that's the thing that we should look at as Christians. While we out evangelizing, keep this in mind. I'm almost done. I know this is a little longer, but I think hopefully this, this, this lights a fire in you for souls. Lights a fire in you that says, even if I've never evangelized before, I have a story to share because I, I have a God I know. So we're servants of all. Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28. Jesus says, it is, not the, it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give glory, give his life as a ransom for many. So when we evangelize, we evangelize with, the, with lo the love of Christ, the kindness and mercy of God, not with his judgment. What is his judgment? What, it, what is his judgment for? To save. In the church. He judges us. And who does he charge har harsher? The leaders. It says, don't, be, don't, don't try to become a teacher. Like, you don't want to be a teacher because you're going to be judged harsher. And that's why some people come here and say, I want to be a teacher in your church. Whoa. Good luck with that. Like, that's, that's going to be harsh. It's, 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 a, it's a heavy burden as a leader. Although Jesus does judge, he doesn't judge the lost, but rather the found. When he judges, he doesn't go out there with a, ju with a, with a, judgment, sta with a judgment gavel. He goes out there with his arms outstretched wide. Because he came, he died for the whole world. He says this, who needs a physician, the sick or the healthy? We carry the physician in and on us. And we're going out there to a world who's sick, who's drowning, who's dying. And so when the Lord leads you to talk to somebody, whether you're eating lunch, having dinner, I, bear, I guarantee you, every time you go out, there's at least one person who's going to lead you to. It may just say, hey, I just want you to know Jesus loves you. God loves you so much. And just move on. It may be that simple. Or it may be, hey, what does this name mean to you? We were out at a conference in, um, what was it, near Hollywood, <laughs> Pasadena, California. We were at a conference. And we're sitting there in a conference. It was a Heidi Baker conference. And I glanced over, there was this lady sitting there. And the, and the Lord said to me, she's my bell. And then he showed me bell from like, um, um, what is it? Beauty and the Beast, like in the yellow dress. And I was like, okay. God goes, tell her. I was like, you want me to go tell her I see this 
the purse is girl the yellow dress and that she's your belt. And I, was, I looked at Olivia, I told her, and she goes, go tell her. And I went, I walked over there, I leaned over, and I said, God says, God showed me a woman in yellow dress twirling, and he says, you're her belle. And she just sc- screamed and started bawling. She says, my name is Amabel, Amabel. And my, mo- my dad just died. He, he, and he's the only one in my life that called me Belle. And I said, well, you have another father that calls you Belle, too. She said, all that depression left her. She wrote me a message on Facebook, like, gosh, six years later. And she said, because of you, now I'm a minister in my church. And I minister to women who, who came from broken homes. I minister to women who are dealing with rejection, and they're being set free. A simple word of knowledge that made no sense to me. Sounded silly. Bell. Like, who would walk up to someone and say, God says you're, you're his bell? Jesus would, because to her, she realized, she said she didn't, she, she couldn't, she had a hard time receiving God as a father until that moment, because her father called her a bell, and also her God called her a bell. And she realized how personal he was. So when we were still sinners, Jesus judged us worthy of life and worthy of his blood. And that's the message of grace and hope and to a broken world and a lost world they need to hear. That, y- that people, may look at, people may look at themselves and go, I'm unworthy. Why would your God, if he's perfect, want me? And just say, because he loves you. He literally came while we were still wretched sinners, while we all fell short. And he literally looks and goes, Ollie's worth it. Lauren's worth it. Melissa's worth it. Tammy's worth it. And he goes, and he looks at the cross and goes, yeah, I'll do that over again for them. Right? And I think that's the, that's, that's the gospel that people need to hear right now. Oh, you're broken? You know what Jesus says? He comes with a broken heart in. You're, you're hopeless and you're an addiction? He said, he, he says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And he wants to set you free. If that's why it's so important to know scripture. Because when you're speaking to a Christian, a churchgoer, there, there are non-Christian churchgoers. When you speak to Christians who are churchgoers, the word of God will preach. A friend of mine called me just before, right after, um, Graham, the tent revival, he says, hey, the word of God preaches. I was like, uh-huh. Like, seriously, the, the story of Jesus preaches. I was like, okay. He goes, all right, man, have a great day. I was like, okay. And I, I had to sit and think about it. I said, I preach the word of God. And I said, but sometimes I go out with the agenda of praying for healing, not the agenda of releasing Christ. Romans 5, 8, and I'm almost done. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were sti- yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just say, you know what? You're confessing all these things in your life. You're, the, you're exactly the type of person he died for. That would have preached to me. Had my friend sat with me and says, man, you're such an, a great guy, but you're into drugs, you're depressed, you're angry, you pick fights with people, which does not all sound like nice guys. You're into drugs. You, you're, you're, you're telling your friends to go womanize and use drugs and drink alcohol. Like, but I was nice to people who needed help. So they thought I was a nice person. But they sat with me and they said, but Jesus literally died for you. While you while, while, died for me when I was still a sinner, and he, and he died for you too. And all the struggles you're going through, he wants to, he wants to walk you out of. All the addictions that you have, he wants to take from you. He took on, he took on, he became sin. Literally, the manifestation of sin, the thing that his father couldn't even look at. He became the thing that his father hated. Can you imagine that? Like, it's like for, for us, for Olivia, this is a joke, but it's for Olivia. 
I would become a cockroach, basically. What, like she, she would run for me. She couldn't even look at me, right? Jesus became the thing that God couldn't look at. Does that make sense? Like, God goes, I'm sorry, son, but I have to forsake you. So he got forsaken so that we can be received. He needed to be forsaken. I bet you the stripes on his back didn't hurt compared to that forsa- being forsaken by his father. I bet you the, the nails in his hands and his feet didn't hurt as much as being forsaken by his father. Being denied three times by one of his b- most beloved people, Peter, probably did not hurt as much as being forsaken by his father. These are some of the things that you have to, you have to allow to, to recalibrate how you think. First, for yourself. Because it's hard to preach the gospel unless your heart knows Jesus loves you. But when you preach the gospel, that's the truth. That's the truth. While we were still broken and still sinners, he died for me. And what he did, and let me explain to you what he means. He forgave me. And now I have a relationship with God, and he wants to have one with you. It's not, hey, you're going to hell. We don't get saved from the fear of hell. It doesn't say that in the Bible. We get scathed from his goodness. We repent because of his goodness. We don't repent because of a fear of hell. If you are able to repent because of a fear of hell, that repentance may not be a pure repentance. When you're out there, here are some keys. Be kind. Be loving. Be merciful. And you have permission to be powerful. These two... They have God's full authority, but they also have Olivia's and my full authority to lead. Like they're walking in proxy of us. You have my, our full authority. Lead it the way that God wants you to lead it. And next time we go out, we may assign two other leaders. Like, like our, we're about growing leaders. Again, I'm going to remind you. That was, where was that at? Romans 2.4. The kindness of God leads hearts to repentance. So you have to be kind. You have to be loving. You have to be merciful. Be graceful, grateful, be powerful. Here's some keys when you're out evangelizing, and I'm going to close. Pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is, is showing you. Kendia, um, Kendrick and India's daughter, asked me this question one time. We were out, we were out ministering. And they, she said, Jonathan, she's young. She goes, it was before she preached a lot. She said, um, how do you know it's the Lord? I was like, what are you talking about? Um, th- like a, a word of knowledge or prophecy, as it will, depends on the environment. If the Lord told me to be at a place at a certain time, I don't have the convenience to doubt what I'm hearing now. If I'm standing on stage preaching the gospel, I have to preach what I'm hearing now. But if I'm just texting Josiah or Hannah an encouraging word, we're going to say, hey, pray about this. Because you can hear it as well, see, be confirmed. So it's, it really depends on the environment. If you're out to evangelize and the Lord told you, hey, go evangelize next Sunday, trust what you're hearing, what you're feeling. It may be a word like bell. Literally, I think I saw a dinner bell, and then I saw a bell dancing, and I was like, bell? What? I am not walking over there and telling this girl that I, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing Beauty and the Beast. Um, Because her husband was a handsome dude. I'm like, ooh, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what. Because I had all these thoughts in my mind because I I wanted to. No, because I wanted to make sense of it. Is the Lord showing me he's a beast? Like, is he angry? Is he mean to her? And I was like, nope, nope. He literally says, she's my bell. So I'm I'm literally only going to drop that. I'm going to drop what I saw and drop that one word and move on. And when she started bawling, her husband's jaw was on the floor. I realized this makes sense to her. And it's okay to say, that, that makes sense to you? <laughs> I, you hear me do that? That makes sense to you? Wow, that's, that was the weirdest word I ever gave. How does it, why does it make sense? My name is Belle. I'm like, that makes perfect sense, right? So be willing to move. If you're praying for someone, like you walk up to someone who looks in full health, and, the, and all of a sudden you go, huh. My back's hurting. Huh, my, my right hip is hurting. And they say, hey, can we pray a blessing over you? And you start praying, and you just go, in Jesus' name, also heal his right hip. They'll flip out. 
They go, how do you know that? Because God loves you. And he showed that to me. It's true. Your hip hurts? Yeah, check it now. It's healed. That's amazing. Why? They're like, you're amazing. No, no, no. God showed, literally loves you so much. He gave me a word. That's called a word of knowledge because he wanted you to know how real he is. Changes their life. That's how you deliver a, a healing word of knowledge. You don't go, you're right. It's all me. Seriously, without the Holy Spirit, you ain't got a word of knowledge. Right? You got to keep that in mind. Without the Holy Spirit, you ain't, got a, you ain't got nothing to deliver. Literally, like I went out, we went out not intentionally to evangelize. I shared this story once or twice before. We went out to pick up a little connector for, a, um, for her iPad once. It was a free connector right down the street. I'll knock on the door. The lady comes out, hands it to me, and holds on to it. And I'm, and I'm like, you want me to pay you for this? And she goes, I know who you are. You're a pastor. And I said, uh-huh. And I let go. And she goes, from God manifest. And I was like, am I about to get, like, shanked? Because that, that was my first thought because I came from the streets. So I'm, like, I'm like, all right, get your hands ready just in case she tries to shank you or whatever. And then she goes, and she said, we almost came to your church. And then her husband opens the door. He goes, I know who you are. You have a woman in leadership. We don't believe in that. I went, oh, that's a shame, but can I have that plug? <laughs> I was like, and he goes, here's what I'm going to do. I want to pray for you too. And I went, he goes, where's your wife? And I went, in the car. You want me to get her? And she comes out. And I said, before, we pray for, before you pray for us, can I pray for your wife's back? And she goes, what? And she goes, uh. And, and I said, is it, what is it? Like, I was like, what's wrong with her back, right? It's like right here. And she, and she said, a slip disc. And I said, can we pray for her back? And she goes, Whoa. And I said, you know what? Before we pray for her, do you have any healings you need? He goes, well, you think you hear from God. He literally walked up to me with his attitude, right? He goes, you think you're hearing God? You tell me. And I went, okay. So let's pray for your, 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 your right shoulder that you dislocated while you, were in, while you were in eighth grade playing football that still hurts for you today. He goes, what? And, I grabbed, and his wife goes, <gasps> and I, so we started praying. Because I literally asked God, I said, God, what do you want to do here? And God says, show him who I am. So I prayed for his shoulder. He goes, all right, all right, all right. Anyways, I, I said, wait, you, what's going on on the left side of your face? Is it your jaw or a molar or a tooth? And he goes, that's my first cavity ever on my upper mouth, and it hurts. And I went, you want that to heal? And he goes, and I touched his face. We prayed. Olivia and I both prayed. And he goes, okay, 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 okay. Like, uh, uh, and I went, okay, so this morning when you woke up, your, your left foot was hurting. The top of it? You felt a pop, and it's been hurting, and you've been limping all day. And he goes, and his wife goes, what? And he goes, and I was like, all right, can I, can I get down and grab your foot? He goes, so I get down. He ended up not praying for us. <laughs> we, pray, we, pray, we, pray for, we prayed for his foot. I got up, and I said, hey, anyways, thank you for this wire. Great meeting you. I said, it's a shame you can't come to a church where there's a woman in leadership. I said, we co-pastor this place. Anyway, he goes, um, uh, you, what time is your service? And I went, the service you're not going to attend? <laughs> Uh, I told him the time. He goes, we'll be there. And I was like, okay. He goes, but I still don't believe women should be speaking at all in church. And I went, I looked at his wife. I said, you okay with that? Because my wife gets to speak. She has a voice. And I said, and all the women in my church have a voice. And I said, if you're okay with that, if you're willing to sit in a place where women are speaking freely, come on, man. And he goes, how'd you do that? And I said, do what? And he goes, um, and he stops and he literally goes, you know what? I evangelize every day, Jonathan. And I went, good for you. A hundred people a day, I, I keep count. And I was like, good for you. Anyways, can I have this wire? Like, <laughs> what, why, I, I, I was not planning, planning on sitting here talk to, to talk to you, right? And he says, and I said, all right. And the Lord says, how many listen? So I looked at him and I said, how many, how many listen? And he goes, what, what do you mean? I said, how many stop and listen? He said, out of the hundred every day. He goes, Potentially four. I said, how many actually receive? He goes, probably one a day. And I went, that's good. You have a soul saved every day. That's awesome. Anyways, he goes, what about you? And I said, I evangelize for six years straight. I'll talk to five people or, or 50 people a day. And I only speak to whoever, want, whoever the Lord leads me to. They all receive something from Jesus. About 80% will receive every single time. But they all stop and listen a little bit. And people who need to get healed, get healed. People who need to encounter Jesus, encounter Jesus. And I said, so 100% of the 80, 80 to 90% of people who stop, meet Jesus. And I said, anyways, 
great meeting you. I just really, I just came for a cord. I said, just a free cord. And he goes, how do you know who to talk to? I said, the Holy Spirit. And he goes, I, ha- I have the Holy Spirit, but th- so you just hear God? And I said, you, sh- you do too. Why don't you start doing that? I said, don't go out there and shoot a shotgun of salvation and waste all your time. Let God guide you to who to speak to. And he started doing that, and healing started happening for the first time in his ministry. Salva- greater salvations are happening. He texts he text me like once or twice a year now. We went out and evangelized. We only talked to 10 people today, and eight of them got saved. I'm like, that is a better percentage. And you didn't, you're not wasting like 12 hours on the street. He was like in and out in four hours. God's amazing. Pay attention to what, what, what God wants to do. Sometimes they need a word of encouragement. Sometimes they're Christians. They need biblical truth, so know your word. Sometimes, ladies, a woman needs a hug. Men, don't go out hugging strangers. Um, sometimes, guys, a man needs a hug. Ladies, don't hug the opposite sex with strangers. Some sure are creepy guys out there. Men do the same. But figure out, hear what the Lord wants to do. The Lord says, go, like, we went out there. It was me, Olivia, and I don't know, two, two other people with us. When we went out there to, to uh, Maryland, it was four of us, right? Three of us. I don't remember. But we literally said, we were walking around Maryland Plaza, and I was thinking, fifth, five below. And Olivia, I looked at Olivia. I said, What's, what are you getting? And then the third or fourth person said, I'm, I'm looking at the five below. And Olivia goes, me two, me three. And then the other person was four. We went there. The first person we encountered was a deaf girl. The mom wouldn't let us pray and got mad at us for believing that God can heal us. Told her to live her off. Should be discouraging. Not anymore. We went in there, and the guy said, go all the way to the back. And the back was this man and a woman shoveling phone cases from five below. And I'm like, get, get some otter boxes or something. They're like, from five below, they're like shoving it in the purse. And we walked up, and we said, excuse me. And they went, <gasps> And as Olivia started praying for her, started evangelizing her, I started evangelizing the husband. Olivia started sharing stories. And, started, and then she asked for prayer. We started laying hands on her. She started to rock back and forth, encountering Jesus in five below. And Olivia goes, what do you do when she falls? <laughs> like, literally, and I was like, she's, she's right. She'll fall on the bouncy balls. Like, there was, there was a little, like, like kickball box balls. It was like a whole thing. And I'm like, that would be interesting to see if she bounces back. Um, <laughs> but they all, they began to repent about their life. When the presence of God shows up tangibly, they start telling us about the things they did wrong. And I was like, I'm, I didn't ask you about your sin. I didn't ask you about your life. I just, Jesus brought us to you just to say he loves you. That's the goal. Jesus led faith to somebody because Jesus loves them. Well, God bless you all.